Okay, well, thank you everybody for being here today. Appreciate your time. Um, today I'm going to be talking about modeling emerald ash borer phenology under climate change um, and also just giving a broader overview of some of the pest modeling tools that we work on at the Oregon IPM Center uh, and specifically for uh, some for invasive species. So um, I have my social media profile uh, handles down here at the corner of the slide um, so you can look me up if you'd like. And I'm at the Oregon IPM Center. I'm also affiliated with the Department of Horticulture at OSU. Oops, one second. Okay, so the outline of my presentation is first I'm going to hopefully convince you that decision support models are important for uh, preventing establishment and controlling invasive species. And second, I'm going to provide some specific examples of some of the uh, forecasts that our models produce uh, for the phenology and climate suitability for emerald ash borer, also called EAB. And then I'll end about talking about uh, future work, so work that we're doing currently, but also hope to do um, going forward. Okay, so if left to spread, invasive species, as we know, cost billions of dollars to manage and can have devastating environmental and economic consequences. Preventing the introduction of pests is the first line of defense against uh, biological invasion. However, for invasive species that slip by our prevention system, so we um, fail to catch them before they arrive, uh, detecting the species early is critical to preventing further spread. So by definition, early detection is the process of surveying for, reporting, and verifying the presence of a non-native species before that founding population becomes established or spreads so widely that eradication is no longer feasible. So early detection and rapid response uh, to invasive species can reduce the need for more costly and riskier interventions. So if we think about the integrated pest management pyramid, the IPM pyramid, um, we want to stay towards the base of that pyramid, if at all possible. So that includes um, cultural controls, um, having physical and mechanical uh, methods to controlling pests. Obviously, for like an invasive species, prevention is critical, right? Because the more that species spreads, uh, the more interventions that are needed to control it. That oftentimes includes, um, you know, having chemical treatments and potentially like with increasing toxicity. Um, and so we want to avoid that if at all possible. So decision support tools um, are essential for, for preventing and managing the invasion of non-native species. Uh, one type of really important decision support tool are uh, phenology modeling tools. So a phenology model addresses the question of when to expect a specific life stage of a pest or any type of organism that you're modeling. Over in this cartoon to the right here, I'm showing a generic life cycle of um, some beetle species. So we have the adults, they lay eggs and those eggs develop, uh, they hatch and turn into larva, and then we have pupation and the life cycle starts over again. So if we can accurately model the progression through the life cycle and understand when to expect certain life stages, we have a better understanding of when to look for a particular invasive species. Uh, we can also install detection devices on time if we know when to expect that stage um, that we're targeting. And also, if that pest is already established, we can make sure that we uh, implement our monitoring activities on time and also uh, manage the populations in time. So for example, Certain life stages are oftentimes more susceptible to insecticides or pesticides, and so they're more effective if we target that specific life stage. Um, another really important type of decision support tool um, are modeling tools that forecast climate suitability. So these address the question of where to expect a particular species. So essentially we're forecasting the risk of establishment based on climate. Okay, so these are important because they help us understand where to look. Over here to the right, I'm showing you a map of climate suitability for invasive fungal pathogen that causes boxwood blight. And kind of the main purpose of what I'm showing you this map is just to show you that um, these warm areas, um, so the more red they are, the more highly suitable they are, compared to these areas that um, like fall outside this pink line that are dark blue and then gray. So those areas are predicted to be either completely unsuitable or they're like low suitability. So in this particular case for this species, it's kind of a waste of time and resources to be conducting um, surveillance in these areas where the pathogen would be unlikely to even survive. So we can focus our efforts in high risk areas. 
All right. So um, importantly, I just want to emphasize that, you know, you can produce a you can produce a model and you can like use climate data for a single year. However, that doesn't really give you decision support for the current day. Right. So we need to have dynamic modeling tools because climate is changing rapidly. So if we have a phenology model and we're only maybe predicting phenology for like the year 2022, you know, that's potentially useful, but what you really need is to understand what's going to happen during the present year, right? And this is important, especially because, as we all know, climate is changing very rapidly. Um, global warming is certainly real. Um, it's happening. It kind of like the impacts are the, the rate of warming varies across the globe. But in this map here, I'm showing you um, 2022 average temperature anomaly compared with 1981 to 2010 baseline. And so um, across most of the globe, we see that we have um, in degrees Celsius up to like three or more degrees Celsius increase in temperatures. So this is significant because for a pest, phenological events um, may occur earlier because it's developing through its life cycle faster. And then also establishment risk may increase in areas that were previously too cold for survival. So this could include like higher latitudes and also like higher elevations where the pest is now able to spread. Okay, so I want to, um, I'm a little bit biased because I work at the Oregon IPM Center, and so I'm going to be focusing on modeling tools that are available through the Oregon IPM Center. I'm not saying that these are the only tools that are available, um, but they're, they're the focus of my talk today. Um, and so I know that uh, Sil uh, Sylvia, um, who is the director of the Oregon IPM Center, she's going to be, I think, providing in the chat some of the links that I'm, I'm going to be um, giving you today. But um, the first set of tools I want to talk about are modeling tools that use weather data, um, or sorry, that use data from weather stations, okay? So I'm going to call these station-based models because they're producing predictions for a single location. So this is the, this is the website, um, uspest.org uh, forward slash dd forward slash model underscore app. When you go to this site, you can, um, you'll see an introduction here that presents um, what the app is. And then you can select a weather station on this tab where I'm pointing to with my, if you see my little arrow here, and then you can select your species model. So this particular um, website, the decision, decision support system um, is open access, meaning you don't have to pay to get any sort of model forecasts. We have a total of 144 models. Um, these include models for crops, plant diseases, insects, weeds. Specifically, we have 28 invasive insect models, and then we have um, over 32,000 weather stations. I also just want to point out that uh, Len Coop, who's in the audience today, he's basically the architect of this uh, system here, this decision support system. So he can answer any, like, probably better answer specific questions about it um, maybe than I could, but. Um, Dan Uppers also, he's the programmer and has been really involved with uspest.org as well. So I just want to um, acknowledge them. Okay, so the work that I've been most involved with at the Oregon IPM Center um, is developing spatial models. So uh, this particular modeling tool is called DDRP. It stands for Degree, Days, Risk, and Phenological Event Mapping. Um, and if you are a programmer, if you're into computer coding, you can also go to my GitHub account um, and download the code if you so wished. <laughs> um, but DDRP, is an, so it's open source, you can download it, like I just said. Spatial modeling tool. So this is different because it produces maps. So the previous tools I was talking about were for single sites. This produces maps. And it combines phenology and establishment risk modeling. So this kind of makes DDRP a little distinct from other uh, forecasting tools that are available for pests because uh, to my knowledge, there are no tools that integrate these two types of models um, in, in that use real-time data. Uh, the applications of maps, um, they could be really useful for area-wide integrated pest management. So like planning at like area-wide scales. Um, so for an invasive species, you can identify areas on the landscape that are at highest risk of establishment and also like understand how the phenology is varying across maybe like the county where you live, for example. Okay. Um, also for species that are already established, these types of maps could be useful for timing management practices. And I'll give some examples of that um, in a few minutes. The home page for DDRP, you can scan this QR code here. Uh, but the web link, uh, the full web address is uspest.org forward slash caps. 
So we have, uh, this is a list of the models that we've developed to date. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about Emerald Ash Borer today, but I just wanted to point out that we have spatial models for 16 invasive species, and these are all insects. And um, as I'm going to mention a little uh, further into my talk, we also uh, very shortly are going to have the model posted for spotted lanternfly. So that's going to be a new invasive insect that we'll have soon. Notice that um, most of these species here are not yet present in, in the contiguous United States. So I'm going to refer to that to CONUS. So CONUS means contiguous United States. That is because uh, a lot of the funding for the development of this tool came from USDA APHIS PPQ. And they, that, so the Cooperative Agricultural Pest Survey Program, they're out conducting surveillance to try to make sure that these particular insects do not become established. So they want to make sure they catch it before it establishes, right? Um, however, notice that there are a few. So we have light brown apple moth. Um, that species is present in California. Also, there's Asian longhorn beetle, which is present um, in certain parts of the eastern US. And then, of course, emerald ash borer, which at this point has become um, fairly widespread, at least in the eastern United States. I also want to point out that we have developed spatial models for three biological control insects. These include Japanese knotweed psyllid, black margin loosestrife beetle, northern tamarisk beetle, and also the invasive fungal pathogen um, that causes boxwood blight has a very long name, Calonectria pseudonaviculata, okay? And all of those species um, are present to some extent in the, um, in CONUS. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, show you some examples of our modeling tools um, for Emerald Ash Borer, specifically models that forecast the phenology and climate suitability of this pest. So um, everybody probably knows what emerald ash borer is, but I'll go ahead and give an overview anyway. So emerald ash borer is a very small, shiny green beetle. It's native to Asia, um, and it's been in the United States since at least 2002. It was probably there earlier. We just didn't detect it until then. Um, it was first found in Michigan. And uh, the larvae feed on the, uh, the tree tissues. So it's the larvae that are the most detrimental to the trees. Uh, they feed on the phloem and the xylem interface of the trees, and that cuts off the movement of food to the roots and water to the canopy, and eventually kills the tree uh, within eight to ten years, depending on this. Uh, our, um, oh, excuse me. So it can kill up to 99% of all ash trees within eight to ten years once it arrives in a particular area. I think that this particular this uh, figure right here, so the June 2006 compared to August 2009, it seems like everybody. Um, it seems like in almost every emerald ash borer presentation I've like I've seen that this photo is often used, and I think it just it just does provide like a really stark uh, image of like the damage caused by this insect. So all of the ash, uh, the fraxinus, so that's the genus of uh, ash, all of the species tested to date are, the, all of them are vulnerable to some extent to emerald ash borer. Uh, and uh, the emerald ash borer was first detected in the West Coast in 2022. And that location is in the forest grove area. So here I have that little pink circle. Um, and we have one species of native ash, Oregon ash fraxinus latifolia. And, you know, it's pretty devastating because we knew it was going to get here at some point, but when it actually got here, it was just like kind of, you know, it's kind of like madness, people, everyone's freaking out because potentially this insect could lead to the functional loss of ash in, at least in the Willamette Valley. So if it continues to spread, we could see essentially almost like the extirpation of this ash, this particular ash species throughout part, at least a lot of its range. Okay, so this is a range map um, of native Fraxinus species that's shown in green here. So everything that's green is where native ash species occur. These little red dots right here, those are counties where emerald ash borer has been detected. And this map, um, oh, I thought I replaced this. Okay, this map is for the year uh, 2022. I thought I must be, I thought that I had replaced this with a more recent map, but I guess it's on a different slide. In any case, um, you can see that, as I mentioned, emerald ash borer is very widespread across the eastern US. However, um, okay, so it's in 36 states and then five Canadian provinces. I just wanna mention though, that the insect is still expanding its range, right? So in the Midwest, it's continuing to expand. Um, it, there are some isolated areas in Colorado where it occurs. Um, and then, as I mentioned, it's in Oregon. It's at that single location in Oregon. 
Also, it's been spreading into these southern locations. Um, so, for example, these these records here in Texas, and then other parts of the South, those are pretty recent establishments. I think just within the last like four or five years or so. Um, so, the insect is still spreading. So this highlights the need to better understand um, where it's going to spread to potentially next, like which areas are suitable. And also if we can predict when we'll find certain life stages, we can detect it early before it spreads even further. So the objective um, specifically for emerald ash borer modeling was to provide real-time forecasts uh, for EAB to support surveillance and management programs. The adult stage of emerald ash borer is most visible because the immature stages are hiding inside the trees. So if we can have forecasts of when to expect adults that could um, support early detection efforts, we can also have preventative insecticide treatments. So if we apply the insecticides um, in advance of when adults will occur, that will allow time, for example, for these uh, systemic insecticides right here. Um, injections right here. So those need a certain amount of time to reach the leaves of the tree. So timing the, the insecticides is really important. Also the timely release of parasitoids. Um, I'll provide some pictures of some of the parasitoids that are being released uh, that attack emerald ash borer. But it's really important that the life cycles of these parasitoids align with their host, which is emerald ash borer. So hopefully like forecasts of egg hatch could be potentially useful for uh, the parasitoid um, programs. And then also, as I mentioned, identifying areas at highest risk. Um, uh, so emerald ash borer is spreading, but we still don't necessarily have a great understanding of what is the coldest areas, like what are the coldest areas where emerald ash borer could spread to, and also what are the hottest areas where it could potentially spread to. So our phenology model, um, it includes all major life stages of emerald ash borer. Um, here I'm showing an image of the life cycle of EAB. And so these numbers right here, so one, two, three, four, and five, those are phenological events that are predicted by our model. Um, our model assumes um, a January 1st start date, and it also assumes a one-year life cycle. So um, I recognize that this is a potential limitation of our model because those of you who know about emerald ash, you know, know about the life cycle, you might know that they, they do have a two-year life cycle in some areas. So that's called like semi-voltanism, meaning that it is too cold for them to complete their life cycle over that single year. And so they overwinter again as a larva. Um, but we're going to assume in this model that the, the emerald ash borer overwinters as a J larva, so it's in this uh, diapause as a J larva, and then sometime uh, during the spring, um, or depending on where you are, what time of year it is, you know, it's going to pupate, and then adults are going to emerge and begin feeding on the ash leaves. Notice that they form these uh, D-shaped exit holes, and so that's a telltale sign that an ash tree um, has been infested with um, emerald ash borers, you see these small D-shaped exit holes. Okay, so the adults mate, um, and then they begin ovipositing, so in other words, laying eggs. On the bark here, those eggs hatch, so egg laying and egg hatch are predicted by our model, and then they form these S-shaped galleries, so as the larvae are feeding, they form these little galleries here. Um, and then again, they, later in the summer, they, again, they kind of curl up into that J shape. So they form, they, they go through these different instars and then they fold up and the last instars is J larva where they fold up. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate the model um, using forecasts for the year 2021 for North America. So the reason I'm doing this is because uh, we published a paper. So uh, the co-author, so um, I was the lead author, and then we have Len Coop and Jian Duan and Toby Patrice for co-authors. And so I'm gonna be showing you some images from this publication. So 2021, um, at the time that I wrote this paper was the fourth hottest year on record for CONUS. 2023, I'm pretty sure was hotter. Um, but anyway, the reason that I chose 2021 is just because it was a hot year. And so I wanted to provide forecasts like to give you an idea of what phenology and climate suitability may be like for a relatively hot year. I'm also gonna show you an analysis where I measure climate suitability over 20 recent years um, to understand how the potential distribution may or may not change uh, according, you know, based on climate data for any given year. Um, I evaluate a predictive accuracy of the models. And then I'm going to tell you about how you can access real-time forecasts and also provide some examples of uh, those forecasts. 
Um, just a very brief summary of the methods. I'd be happy to talk to you in more detail about this. Um, I don't really yeah, have time to go into the nitty gritties, but um, would be happy to you know, answer further questions about it. So very briefly, again, this spatial model, it predicts both when and where to expect Emerald Ash Borer. The phenology model, well, both the phenology model and the climate suitability model, they, they were developed using lab-derived data. So this was previously published data, for example. Um, so people, you know, when you're measuring developmental rates, you can rear insects at constant temperatures and, you know, measure how development um, is progressing at different temperatures. So those type of data were used. Um, also like survival. So for climate suitability, looking at like what were the thresholds at which the insects, like the survival, uh, tended to, de to decline. For the phenology model, we also use observations of adult activity um, from monitoring studies in the Midwest. And for the climate suitability model, I used records from uh, the native range of Emerald Ash Borer in China and also some records from North America to uh, calibrate the model. To validate the phenology model, I used 56 phenological observations from the eastern US collected over the past 20 years or so. And then I also uh, had four observations from Russia. I'm not going to be talking too much about Europe today. I am going to show a couple slides. But just to let you know, this model can be used in Europe, but there are some uh, caveats to that, which I'll discuss in a few minutes. To validate the climate suitability model, um, I used 3,000 presence records from areas that were not used for uh, model calibration, including records from Europe. So here is a phenological event map uh, for the year 2021. Okay, so I don't, I don't know, maybe I already said this, but you know, one of the reasons that forecasting first adult emergence for emerald ash borer is so important because adults are basically the only stage of the insect that occurs outside of the tree. So you want to make sure that when that, you know, when it's visible, you want to make sure you see it, right? So that's one of the reasons I'm kind of focusing a lot on this particular phenological event. In this map here, let me walk you through it. Um, the blue line is the range boundary of 16 species of native ash in North America. So notice that the colors that fall outside of that blue line, um, those are semi-transparent just because I'm trying to focus on the you know, areas of the native range of ash here. Okay, so the colors are the week in which uh, first adult emergence was predicted. So not surprisingly, we see that down in Florida, which to my knowledge, Emerald Ash Borer is not down there, but if it were down there, it's, it would be predicted to emerge um, in like February. Compared to up in Canada, where we have emergence occurring as late as July and August. Areas that are this very lightest gray color, um, this represents areas where adult emergence did not occur because there wasn't enough, uh, basically it wasn't warm enough in those areas for the species to develop to that part of its life cycle. Um, so that could indicate maybe that, you know, it, if it did occur there, it would have a, a semi-volting life cycle, so it would need at least, you know, it would need two years to develop. Areas that are this medium and the dark gray, those represent areas that were predicted to be unsuitable due to climate stress. Specifically up here north, these areas would be too cold for establishment based on climate data for that year. The areas down south here, so like in the uh, Valley of California, and then also Arizona, you know, some of these areas in northern Mexico and Arizona and California, those were predicted to be too hot for establishment. Okay, so the dark gray areas, we say that that's severe climate stress exclusion. So those are areas where long-term establishment would be highly unlikely. These light, these light gray areas, those could represent um, areas that could be suitable for short-term establishment. It could also represent model uncertainty, so we're not quite sure. Um, we, like we need more data to maybe calibrate our model. I just want to point out, though, that unfortunately, notice how there are like no gray, well, there's like a few up in Canada here, but notice that the whole range of ash is predicted to be um, climatically suitable for emerald ash borer. Um, okay, so these are predictions of first egg hatch. So the climate suitability model is the same, so that part of the map is the same. Um, but notice that the colors are different here because we are predicting first egg hatch, which um, in general occurs about one month after uh, first adult emergence. If we're talking about just so we're focusing on the Western US, since um, this IPM hours for you know, the Western region, uh, we see that, um, for example, in Oregon, um, adult emergence is predicted sometime in June compared to egg hatch, which is occurring a little bit later um, you know, in July. 
So I evaluated a predictive performance of the model. I'm going to walk you through this plot right here. So on the y axis, we have predicted day of year. On the x axis, we have observed day of year. This diagonal line right here is a one to one relationship between those two variables. So if you see these little colored points right here, these shapes, if the, the closer those are to the one to one line, that means that there is a greater, the model is uh, predicting, you know, the model, model predictive accuracy is very high. What we, and obviously we see some spread here. So I, um, I had very few, uh, I almost considered throwing these out of my study just because there's only three. So notice I only have three observations for first pupation. Also for first egg hatch, I only have three points. So most of my, most of my points I used for model validation were for adult events. Um, I just want to point out that the mean absolute error for adult events was about one week. So you can see that, you know, there's a pretty close correspondence. It's not perfect. Um, immature stages was a little bit higher, but like I said, I had very few data points to work with. So obviously that needs to uh, be investigated further. Okay, so uh, this is a map of the potential distribution of emerald ash borer based on climate. On the left-hand side, to the right here, I'm showing the range map for the th uh, 16 native species of ash. The pink dots right here, those are records, uh, those are presence records for emerald ash borer. Okay, so what I did, I ran the spatial model. I ran it for 20 recent years. So I ran the model uh, using 20 different climate data sets, okay? And then I overlaid those results to figure out what were the number of years where emerald ash borer is predicted to be present across all of those 20 modeled years. So areas that are yellow, those were predicted to be suitable for emerald ash borer for all 20 years. Areas that are blue, so like the very darkest blue, those are predicted to be unsuitable across all 20 years. Um, okay, so we see that there are very few areas that are that darkest shade of blue. Um, some exceptions are some areas of the Southwest, for example, in Arizona and California, and also maybe a few small areas of, North, of Canada. Again here, kind of like that result I was showing you before, where it does look like, in general, that range boundaries, like the northern range boundary for, um, I think there's uh, three native ash species that occur like in, up in Canada here. It does overlap uh, pretty well, you know, with these areas that were predicted to be suitable across all 20 years. However, again, notice that there are some pockets that I'm pointing out with my, I don't know if you can all see my cursor, but there are some pockets that look like they were predicted to be too cold for um, establishment on some years. Okay, so there may be small areas that could be refugia. Suitability was correctly predicted for over 98% of the records that I used for model validation. I also just want to mention here, I thought this was really interesting. Um, see how down here in northern Mexico, there's actually a few native species in northern Mexico of ash. And so I thought it was interesting that there appeared to be, there was heat stress predicted in some of those areas. So, you know, um, I don't know, we can only hope, right? We kind of we kind of need to understand a little bit more about emerald ash borer's um, heat tolerance. We kind of understand its cold tolerance better. So I imagine as it continues to spread, maybe we can calibrate this model uh, as we better understand like what its uh, capacity for uh, heat tolerance is. So you can access real-time forecasts of emerald ash borer phenology um, at, that U at uspest.org uh, forward slash dd forward slash model app. Um, the outputs are in two different um, formats. So here I'm showing the tabular results. So what I did, just to provide you all with an example, I ran the model for a weather station in Corvallis. It's called CR, the abbreviation of CRVO for 2024. Okay. Um, and this is what the model output. So um, if you look at the table here, so there's our model start date is January 1st. Um, first adult emergence in Corvallis is predicted to occur on June 24th. First egg hatch is predicted to occur on July 29th. You can also sign up to get email notifications. So right below the table here, you'll see this uh, um, uh, in blue, you'll see just click on that. You can get uh, notifications to warn you when these, when, when these events are coming up. Um, so the graph here is showing similar results, but it's showing a, a, a few more details. So degree days, um, degree days is a type of like uh, heat unit. So that's how the model is measuring these phenology or predicting these phenology events. 
um, is on the y-axis. So as more degree days accumulate, you have more development occurring. The x-axis has dates. The uh, purple line is the phenology of emerald ash borer um, for the current year, so for 2024. We're also showing uh, lines for based on climate normals for 1981 to 2010. The average, so average of the last 10 years is the green line. Um, and then 2023, so the previous year. So you can kind of compare the phenology of emerald ash borer um, across, you know, using climate averages and also using the current year and compare it to the last year. So the spatial forecasts for um, emerald ash borer and other invasive insects are at uspest.org forward slash caps. Um, you can access the outputs in raster format and also in as image formats. So you could import the rasters into your own GIS system um, and analyze them in any way you'd like. The forecasts are updated every two to three days. This is a screenshot of the homepage. Um, and first of all, notice that on the first column here, we have all of the various species um, that we've developed models for. And then the rest of the columns provide uh, thumbnails of the images for a certain phenological events. And also, um, so first spring adults, first egg hatch. This map right here, current stage and generations, I'll, I'll provide you an example of that in just a minute here. And also voltanism, so the number of generations that are predicted to occur over the year. Okay, so um, I, yeah, click on the folder to access all of the model outputs. So on that EAB2 folder right there. So here's a phenological event map uh, for emerald ash borer for the present year, so 2024. So notice um, this is really similar to the map I showed you before, but it's using climate data for the current year. And so we're forecasting out the entire year, right? So um, we're using um, NMME, for those of you who may be familiar with climate data sets, we're using NMME forecasts, okay? Um, and so this goes all the way through the end of the year to December 31st. Um, again here, notice that these dark gray areas, those are areas that are predicted to be climatically unsuitable. So these were predicted to be excluded by uh, severe heat stress. Areas that are white uh, were predicted the uh, adult emergence was not predicted to occur in those particular areas because it was just too cold for it to progress to that um, to that life stage or to that that stage. Again, here up in Oregon and most of the West, we see that adult emergence is predicted to occur sometime in June or July, um, and even as late as August at some of these like the coldest areas. <clears throat> Um, this is a different way of looking at the results. So this is kind of like a snapshot for any given day. So this map right here was like showing the whole year. This map, which we call like the current stages and generations, this is for a specific day. So in this case, I'm showing you a map for April 4th, uh, 2023. So uh, this is for, this is showing all of the stages that are present on that date. So as of April 4th, 2023, you can see that uh, the emerald ash borer was mostly an overwintered larva um, across the range. So in other words, it still has not emerged from overwintering. Um, down south here, like in Florida and parts of the south, we see that there are uh, pupa and adults present. And in some cases, we even have uh, first generation eggs. So egg laying has already occurred. Um, this particular map right here, so uh, this, <laughs> I was debating whether to show this map or not, because it's not necessarily something that, um, it may not be as useful, but I, I think that it's really cool, because it gives you an example of like how the phenology is progressing over the year for like, a, you know, a given stage. Um, so this is showing the proportion of the population that is in the adult stage. All right, so we're looking at adults. And as what you're going to see is um, this is going to move through uh, each month of the year, and it's going to show the proportion of the population that's in the adult stage. So that ranges from zero to 90. Okay, so as of January 30th, 2023, you can see that almost all of the emerald ash borer in CONUS is um, they're predicted they're they're not adults yet, right? They're still in that probably uh, overwintered state, uh, the overwintered um, larva or pupa stage. Okay, so I'm going to play this. So what you're going to see is this band as we're uh, moving um, through the year. So each month of the year, we're seeing that emergence is happening at these higher latitudes. So adults are present. Okay, 
and we're getting into summer now. Um, I also wanted to point out here that one reason I wanted to show you this video is that you can also see the climate stress accumulating. So um, in this case, we're seeing heat stress accumulating. So I'll go ahead and play that one more time, okay? Um, so again, we have adults emerging down south, kind of moving upwards latitudinally, and now we're starting to get into summer, um, and we're going to see that heat stress accumulating down south, some parts of the south, all right, so anyway, I just I just thought it was kind of a neat video to show. And one thing I want to point out, though, is that our spatial model, it allows for developmental variation within populations. So that contrasts for, for other models for emerald ash borer out there assume that all individuals in the population develop at the same rate. So our spatial model can account for some of that variation that occurs within populations. Um, so Len, uh, who's a co-author on pretty much all this work, uh, he's the one that developed this. This is interactive forecast for Emerald Ash Borer in Oregon. So the web link to that uh, app is right here. Um, so essentially what you can do uh, is you can pan the map, you can zoom in, and you can also to look at like, in this case, we're showing uh, earliest adult emergence. Um, you can click on a location. So I think that query, see that little query right there? So on that particular uh, location, adult emergence is predicted for June 9. You can also click on individual weather stations and run the site-based model. Okay, so you select the model here and then calculate, and then you can get those graphs and the tables that I was showing you earlier. Um, and then we have uh, some major collaborators at the USA National Phenology Network. Um, so they also are taking our forecast. So they're using those raster files that are produced by the model and they are importing them and creating their own versions of these forecasts. So this particular map um, I, I pulled from yesterday. So if you go to the USA MPN website here, um, you'll see forecasts for all sorts of different pests. So emerald ash borer is just one out of several. Um, and so these are also continuously updated at least every two to three days, um, I think every two days. Uh, and notice that this map is showing the predictions a little bit differently than what I was presenting before. So the way that they show their forecasts is that uh, is relative to the current date, like the map issue date. So we can see that this week is orange, okay? So this week, Emerald ash borer is predicted to be emerging um, in Tampa, Florida. <laughs> and like, if emerald ash borer was there down in Florida, it would be emerging down there. Uh, compared to most of the northern half of CONUS, um, emerald ash borer is not predicted to emerge for two or more months, right? Okay, so you can also, they also have forecasts for egg hatch and you can sign up to receive the pheno forecast notification. So be notified by email approximately two, we two weeks and again, six days ahead of when the, uh, the, that phenological event is predicted to happen for your area. And also another thing that's really cool about the USA MPN's infrastructure is that they have this, um, they have a visualization tool for multiple different forecasts, including Emerald Ash Borer. So I'm gonna play a short video here of what you do. So when you go to their visualization tool website, you click on um, map here, and then you select pheno forecasts, and then you select your species. So I'm gonna select emerald ash borer adult. Um, okay, so notice that you're seeing a map similar to what I just showed you. You can zoom into the map and then you can also pan it. So like grab it and pull it over. Um, and similar to that map, similar to the tool that I was showing you that Len developed, this one you can like click on the pixel and then bring up the date for that phenological event. And so now I'm showing, I'm gonna show maps of egg hatch. So kind of the same thing, zoom in, um, pan and zoom, you know, click on a location. So um, this is like the forest grove area. So last year emergence was predicted around June 24th and then egg hatch was predicted for August 2nd um, of that same year. Okay, so in summary, um, I showed you a bunch of examples of forecasts of when and where to expect emerald ash borer. The forecasts are available at uspest.org and also at the USA National Phenology Network. I did find evidence of good predictive performance, at least for the adult stage. And I think these forecasts will be helpful 
for decision support for the adults. So they can support early detection efforts, for example, making sure that uh, traps are hung out on time and also to know when you should be looking for adults, right? So when you might see them actually flying around. Um, also could be useful for timing insecticide treatments. Uh, so making sure that those preventative insecticides are um, injected into trees prior to the adults feeding on the leaves. And for the immature stages, um, so there is an egg parasitoid called uh, Oobius, and then there's Chitrasticus and Toothspathia species. So Oobius is an egg parasitoid. These two, these, the other three species are larval parasitoids. So I'm hoping that these forecasts of egg hatch um, could be helpful for planning the release of these biological control agents, and also potentially for timing certain insecticides that um, impact the immature stages as well. Okay, so can we slow the spread of EAB in the West? And I hope the answer to that is yes. <laughs> I hope that by having these types of decision support tools, uh, even if we can't prevent its spread, at least we can slow it down, right? Um, so we wanna do whatever we can to protect our native ash species and also um, the ash that are grown in urban settings. I think I forgot to mention that, but of course there's also a lot of um, ash that are uh, cultivated like in suburban landscapes, right? So emerald ash borer is a threat to all of those. And so I, I hope that um, having these forecasts can be helpful. I also just wanna mention um, that EAB is invasive in Europe um, and it's also spreading in Canada. So kind of like the bummer is that the climate data for all of North America and also for Europe, there is a delay in their release. So they're not real time like the PRISM data set. So um, that basically means that you can, you can predict phenology. It's just that you can't like, it's harder to forecast for the present day and into the future, right? Um, but I'm just gonna go ahead and quickly show you some results that I produced for Europe. And this is just a, a, um, a presence map of where Emerald Dashboard has been found. Uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty widespread now in the Moscow region of Russia. It's also spread into the Ukraine and other parts um, of, yeah, mostly, mostly Ukraine, like Eastern Ukraine here. As if Ukraine needed, as if they need more problems, right? Um, so these are phenological event maps for Emerald Ash Borer um, in Europe. So I think one of the, you know, one of the things I just want to quickly point out here is that based on um, the study, based on this model, it appears that the entire, uh, so there's three species of native ash in Europe. And according to the model, all of those, um, all that area is predicted to be climatically suitable, right? Um, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a big bummer. Um, but again, here we see first adult emergence, mostly occurring uh, in the summertime in June throughout most of Europe here, egg hatch occurring a little bit later in the year. Um, it also, it's interesting because like if you look at the United Kingdom, it looks like there's some areas that uh, adult emergence is not predicted to occur. So again, these could be areas that potentially the light, it might be harder for it to complete its life cycle in some of these cooler areas. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm kind of, I don't wanna to take too much time here. Um, I'm just gonna, I might, well, I don't know if I'll skip this slide. I kind of just wanna point out here that I was looking at climate, like potential impacts of climate change on phenology. So this is a, this is a, a trend analysis I did for first adult emergence. The cooler colors mean that um, there was, uh, as, as we go further, as we go later in time, uh, um, emergence is occurring earlier in the year, right? So you would expect that under global warming that emergence would be, uh, that dates would be declining, right? So they would be coming out earlier. Um, and so I did find some interesting trends. Um, so the cooler colors mean that emergence is occurring earlier, redder colors means emergence is occurring later. Um, but notice that only some of these trends were statistically significant. So um, I'm pointing out some of those areas with these black arrows. So for example, in North America, there were some parts of the northern US that were um, where we did find significant um, trend towards early emergence, and also down here in Mexico and southern US. Um, over here in Western or in um, Western Russia and Eastern Europe here, this is interesting because actually the rate of climate warming is most rapid in this part of Europe. So I thought that kind of made sense that these areas are experiencing, um, or, you know, the, the adults are emerging earlier. <clears throat> okay, so I'll wrap up uh, talking about future work. Um, so one of the things that we're working on is increasing model realism. So uh, for example, we're including photo period into some of our species models. This can improve predictive accuracy for insects that um, have photo period cued diapause. 
Um, just as an example here, I'm showing uh, maps of voltanism. So that's number of generations per year for Alpha Lara itadori, the Japanese knotweed psyllid. So this map is based only on temperature. Okay, so we're modeling phenology just with temperature using climate averages. This map over here includes a photo period Q diapause response in the psyllid. All right, and so notice how different these maps are. So if we do not include photo period, we would be greatly overestimating how many generations per year the psyllid could complete, right? So we want to um, we want to include this type of code in our models for invasive species. So anyway, um, that's one thing that we you know as we develop new models, we can include this like photo period response. Um, another thing we want to include is moisture factors, um, so we can model plant pathogens and weeds. So we already have a prototype of where we did this for uh, Calinectria pseudonaviculata, which causes boxwood blight. I'm showing you here a map of cumulative infection risk for 2020. And so this map includes uh, uh, dry stress, heat stress, and cold stress. And also the infection risk, um, the moisture factors also, um, you know, play into that. So infection risk is higher when temperatures are ideal and also when moisture conditions are ideal. We I'm um, working with the soil moisture active passive data set, so soil moisture data um, to uh, include in models for weeds, for example. Um, so that's an ongoing project. We're also developing models for more invasive species. So as I kind of mentioned earlier, spotted lanternfly, that model will be um, up really soon. We also are developing models for uh, monolinea species that cause brown rotten stone fruits, a uh, model for Japanese beetle, model for cheatgrass, and then also a model for yellow star thistle. Um, so for this particular project for yellow star thistle, we're also modeling, uh, we're gonna be modeling phenological synchrony between star thistle and um, a new biocontrol agent. <clears throat> If you're interested in the spotted lanternfly forecast, uh, please take this survey. I have a QR code here. Um, and so this is your opportunity, right? So we want your feedback on how we can make our models better and also like what you would like to see. So this is an example of a survey that the Pheno forecast, they do this a lot, you know? So they do a lot of outreach to ask people these, you know, to get feedback on what they wanna see, um, what they like, what they don't like, right? So um, yeah, you should participate. And also we're going to continue to validate forecasts. Um, if you work with Emerald Ash Borer and you're seeing it out in the field, we want you to submit your observations. This data can potentially help us improve the model. So if you go to USA MPN's website here, you can, there's a um, EdMapS form that's embedded at their website. So you can like enter your observations, right? Um, and then we're going to be doing outreach and product improvement. So both Oregon IPM Center and National Phenology Network, we're going to be recruiting, training, and engaging potential model end users, developing modules on how to interpret forecasts and submit observations, and gathering feedback to improve formats and delivery of forecasts. Um, okay, so lastly, um, we are going to be building infrastructure and code to forecast phenology and establishment risk under future climate change scenarios. So all of the work I've been talking about so far, I've, I've kind of been talking about short-term climate forecasts. This is more looking longer into the future, so further out into the future. So, um, you know, as I was mentioning, we, we expect that the phenology and, and um, establishment risk is going to change as climate keeps getting warmer. So it'd be nice to have like these forecasts under using different climate change scenarios. So there's lots of different models. So we can kind of get an idea, like look at uncertainty. So like, okay, well, if the emission scenario is this case, you know, if it's a hotter, if there's more carbon emissions, right, it's going to be hotter. And so we want to kind of understand like how the phenology and establishment risk might change over the long term. Okay, take home messages. I hope I convince you that dynamic modeling tools are needed to control pests as climate changes. Um, forecasts of when and where to expect pest life stages can improve, uh, provide decision support for early detection and management programs, and that you can help. Um, we'd like you to submit observations and give us feedback. That would be really great. Um, and again, modeling tools at Oregon IPM Center. If you go to the um, Oregon IPM Center website, you can find them there. Um, and with that, I will um, happy, val happy Valentine's Day, and thank you for being here. And uh, there's all the links that I was talking about over the course of my presentation. We all like, we mostly like bees, right? We don't like Emerald Ash Borer, but I think most people like bees. So thank you. Thanks, Brittany. That was terrific. Um, mm -hmm. So for anyone who is uh, on the line, you can either submit your question through the chat. I'm monitoring the chat. 
Um, or you can take your mic off of mute and you can post your question that way. Uh, you will notice that in the chat, uh, Sylvia Ronan has um, put a variety of the uh, links that um, Brittany mentioned throughout her talk. So, Brittany, I'm not seeing any questions yet, so I guess that means I get to ask all of <laughs> okay, my questions. Okay, sure, yeah. At yeah. least one of them, anyway. Um, so, I'm curious, uh, do, you have any ex uh, do you have any examples where um, a, a, an agency, say a state agency, let's say, has actually um, used your prediction model to go out and sample and actually found the beetles as a result of the predictive model? I mean, is anybody using it and are there any examples of that actually working out the way it's supposed to as it's drawn up on the chalkboard? Yeah, um, well, so um, <clears throat> I do have potentially one example, but it was more just someone who was, I think it was, a, try to remember which agency he was at. We did have one person who he let us know of when he, when they saw you know the adults emerge and compared that to our model so he actually told us like oh look you know it's basically like two days difference right it was like a really close correspondence so we've had that happen um but th these particular forecasts we haven't had them up that long um and so i think maybe so no <laughs> i i actually do not but i think that i will i'm hoping that we will have examples of that i think also we just need to get the word out right so that's one of the one of the problems is that we have all of these uh, models at uspest.org, but I think some cases people don't know they're there, right? And so uh, it's kind of giving these presentations and um, doing outreach that will kind of tell people, you know, like, hey, these are available. And, and I think then we'll be getting more, um, hopefully, <laughs> more people using them and then giving us feedback on how they're working. Yeah, so, yeah that makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, this was a question that I had asked, um, you know, that I had asked Len Coop you know, mm -hmm. like, like how many, and it would be good to collect this kind of information, how many people are actually using this, this tool to make their decisions, because yeah. that, that kind of impact would be really great to be able to show. Yeah, I know, I agree with you. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, um, so mm -hmm. We do have a, we do have another question in the chat. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go with my other questions. Um, and uh, the question is, um, are you familiar with uh, Dave Crowder's predictive models that are coming out of Washington State, um, such as the one with coddling moth? And uh -huh. how are um, those two sort of modeling efforts the same or different? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm definitely familiar with, um, yeah, the Washington State Decision Aid System. So I, I do not use it though, because you have to pay for it. <laughs> um, so one of the ways they're different is that you don't have to, um, there's no subscription fee. And yeah, I mean, but they do have some great models. Um, and so um, I think that another way they're different is that, so for example, these spatial models that I was showing you, um, we have a forecast of establishment risk and phenology. So let me just go to like some examples of that. So like, like these ones, so like here, um, our maps integrate the establishment risk and the phenology. And so I think that's one thing that really makes them unique. Um, and what else? Uh, like I said, our models too, we do try to incorporate population variation. So it adds a little bit of complexity. A lot of times um, phenology models, they kind of assume that the population is developing like all at the same time. So, um, so there's kind of some like mechanics of the models that could be a little bit different, but yeah, I mean, I definitely think that decision aid system is probably a really great uh, resource for some people, you know, such as for coddling moth management. I will note that I think we do have the, a coddling moth, a coddling moth uh, model also at uspest.org. <clears throat> great. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, yeah. That actually puts us right at one o'clock. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions from anybody in the chat, and I don't see anybody taking their mic off mute. So um, I just want to say thank you again for a wonderful talk. Really appreciate it. Uh, and let everybody know that we do not currently have a talk scheduled for, uh, for March, uh, but um, we will let you know through the newsletter uh, when we schedule the next IPM hour. So thanks again, Brittany. And everyone, enjoy your 
Happy, val happy Valentine's Day. <laughs>